Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. It seems to me that we human beings spend an inordinate amount of our time interacting with non-existent entities. So, you know, your favorite characters on The, the Wire or uh, uh, James Bond or whoever it happens to be. And there has to be some kind of reason for this. And I, I think it's a reason beyond just pleasure. I think there's something else that we get from that engagement. I don't think it's just pleasure. And I also don't think it's something like information or instruction or moral improvement. I think, I think it's something deeper and more interesting than that. So that's what drew me to that. I, I'm trying to figure out what it is that we're, we're up to. And I'm also in the process trying to figure out um, whether there's a better and a worse way of doing it. Is there a way that we can read or watch which is going to allow us to, to get more out of the reading experience or the viewing experience? I guess the first step is, for me, is always um, falling in love with a a work of fiction. And I, I have this perhaps somewhat outmoded belief in genius. I think that there are just some people who do things better than other people. I mean, Toni Morrison is a genius. Uh, she knows how to do things with words. And so I, I, the first stage for me is just, it's not even really a choice. I just, in a way, get chosen by certain works and I fall in love with them. And then I just, in a sense, uh, efface myself in front of them. I just let, try to let the work talk to me and try to keep myself out of the way of it. Uh, and just spend a, a long time uh, figuring it out, figuring out what's going on in that work and, and what it's trying, not trying to say to us, but trying to do to us. What's supposed to happen to us when we read Song of Solomon, for example? And so that's the first stage. And then I guess I, I teach it, because you never know something until you've tried to explain it. I mean, that's when you, <laughs> that's when you really realize how little you know something. Um, and yeah, then many, many years later, uh, after many iterations of teaching and thinking and making unbelievably copious notes, then I might risk writing something about it. Here's something that, that I often think of. Um, the, the line that Isaiah Berlin once said, um, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I guess my, my research process definitely has fox periods and hedgehog periods. <laughs> periods where I'm off rooting around like a fox among uh, various possible books and talking to a bunch of people. And then there's the period where I'm much more hedgehog-like and I curl up in a little ball and just sit with my computer and my library. So the, there'll be periods of my day in which I'm uh, much more gregarious and outward looking and having lots of conversations with people, exchanging ideas with people, uh, reading around very widely. And then there'll be periods of my day where I'm trying to synthesize and compress and, and, and maintain a really sharp focus on a delimited area of study. So that, may, that makes for a rather convoluted day because you know, you're teaching, you're advising, and in between times you're off having wild conversations about 10 different things. And then there's a very quiet moment where you're just tackling one very specific question. Here, here's something that I discovered uh, in my, the recent phase of my research, which completely shocked me. And that is that uh, the reason that Jesus speaks in parables is so as not to be understood. I think that's completely stunning. Um, and it, it's at its clearest in the book of Mark, and some people would say it's not, uh, this is not shared by Matthew, but at the very least in the book of Mark, the reason that Jesus gives for speaking in parables is so that people will not understand what he's saying, because if they understood what he was saying, they might convert. And if they converted, they might be saved. And this would be a terrible result. Uh, there are people who just aren't, equipped to do the things that are necessary to achieve salvation and they need to be uh, prevented from attaining a kind of a cheap conversion that won't be uh, reliable. And the other thing is that yes, for the, for the people who 
who are capable of attaining salvation, uh, the parables are designed to make them better at what they do, which is to say, better at handling parabolic language, which is to say, better at seeing the world from God's point of view. So the parables are, I mean, just this extraordinary device, first for separating people out into the deserving and undeserving, and second for getting the deserving up to the maximum level of spiritual uh, achievement. So that's already a wonderful thing to know. Um, but it has the added bonus for me of making me think very hard about what the function of, of, of using these little miniature fictions is in, in the context of a religious discourse. So here's a religion in the process of being created. And here's its founder, and again, extraordinary genius. I mean, whatever one thinks about his, his divine status. Um, choosing a fictional form in which to do most of his preaching. And realizing that using a fictional form makes things more complicated, not simpler. And that's the whole point. That's pretty striking. For a few years now, I've been teaching The Usual Suspects, the film from 1995. First of all, the main character is the devil. Secondly, he wins. Good does not triumph in this movie. Evil triumphs in this movie. And we are delighted. We could not possibly be happier. So, although I was teaching this film for other reasons, it served a certain function in the course, I started asking myself the question, why are we so happy? Why does this film fill us with such extraordinary pleasure, even though this horrible person, who is essentially equated with the devil, gets away with everything that he's done and goes on to do even more horrible things, no doubt, in the future. And it, it struck me the only reason, the only way we could explain this is that the devil is enchanting. We think of the devil as filling the world with dread and horror, and that our psychic life would be much better off if there were no devil. I mean, obviously many people don't believe in the devil, but I think those who do would really rather live in a world in which there wasn't one. But I think we prefer to live in a world in which there's a devil, or at least his secular counterpart, which is the master criminal. We love believing in these almost superhuman malevolent entities. I won't name names, but we know who they are, right? Uh, they are in control of every bad thing that happens, whereas in reality, you know, bad things are messy but it makes the world so much more beautiful and exciting to think that all the bad things in the world actually come from one source. All the bad things in the world have a kind of logic to them. All the bad things in the world are willed by one sort of spider at the center of the web. That's the, the image that, uh, that Conan Doyle uses about Moriarty. So ultimately, and I think this came as a big surprise to me, the devil is one of the most enchanting figures that we have at our disposal. Mostly, I just fall in love with things. Um, I, I'm just gripped by something. I guess I'm always on the lookout for uh, uh, new fictions that I haven't read, films that I haven't seen, and every now and again one of them just grips me. And I, I fall in love with it and I develop this powerful trust for the person or people who produced this work. I think, you know, these people know what they're doing. I'm in good hands here. I read Tony Morrison's Song of Solomon, I just feel it. I know this woman is a master at what she does. And I don't know what she's doing, but she does. And my job is just to find that out. So essentially, the way I get inspired is just to come across things that grip me. And they will just take me wherever they lead. And I'm just there, ultimately I'm just their, uh, their slave. I'm just their passive um, servant, in a sense. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.